Hey everyone, I'm Jeremy Safran and this is Kitco News. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel for the latest. Well, today on the show, we're nearing Bitcoin's halving event. And this is, of course, when reward for mining Bitcoin transactions is cut in half, which happens roughly every four years. Now, this event is crucial because it reduces the rate at which new Bitcoins are generated, making them more scarce and potentially more valuable over time. Now, this year's halving event could be different. Why? Well, multiple spot Bitcoin ETFs launched earlier this year and mainstream dollars poured into crypto in the billions. Now, this surge reflects not just a growing institutional appetite for cryptocurrencies, but also cements digital assets as a mainstream financial instrument. Now, despite significant early inflows, the market has experienced some volatility after Bitcoin hit an all-time high of just over $73,000. Now, let's unpack how this affects the price of Bitcoin and its impact on the miners who keep running the network for us. Uh, we're joined by Matt Ballenschwag, uh, Managing Director of BitGo. Matt, thanks for coming on and talking to us today. Thanks so much for having me. Really, uh, really a pleasure to be on the show. Yeah, thanks, man. Uh, I'm excited about this because you're going to also educate me. So let's break this down. You know, many of our viewers might be new to this. Uh, start explaining to us, if you would, about Bitcoin having. Why is it a critical event for the Bitcoin network here? Absolutely. Um, so the Bitcoin having is a once every four year event. Um, and there's only been three of them to date. So basically the um, block reward that miners earn for validating transactions on the network, um, you know, is, is really um, halved every four years. So this year, really tomorrow uh, is, is going to be the, uh, you know, the date where basically uh, every block that's mined rather than miners earning roughly 6.25 Bitcoin per block, that will drop down to 3.125 BTC. So mm -hmm. you'll have kind of roughly this 450 BTC per day decrease in new supply on the market. Um, the halving, uh, like I said, right, happens every 210,000 blocks. It's a critical part of Bitcoin's programmatic monetary system. Uh, it keeps Bitcoin scarce, keeps the miner space highly competitive. And ultimately, right, this will, this will happen until Bitcoin becomes fully diluted in the year 2140. So it'll basically asymptotically approach its fully diluted value between now and then systematically. It's a beautiful thing. Um, as Bitcoin is now in the kind of global main stage, you know, this will be, this will be a time every four years, similar to the World Cup or Summer Olympics or an election year where you have this having event. So certainly an exciting time. And there's obviously a lot of short and long-term implications uh, on the ecosystem because of this. Now, bring it back just a little bit here, because I had some friends, I was talking to them yesterday, some familiar with the equity market, some more familiar with crypto. And I said, you know, do you know what this having is? And a lot of them said, well, it's less Bitcoins on the market. That's not true. There's always going to be 21 million. That's the, the existing outstanding effect. It just means bringing less to market. Go back a little bit and, and talk about this with me. Yeah, that's right. So the total supply of Bitcoin ever to be in circulation is 21 million Bitcoin. Um, yeah. You know, since Bitcoin's origin to date, those Bitcoin have methodically been issued into circulation via minor activity and uh, blocks being mined, right? So to your point, um, once we get to that critical mass of 21 million Bitcoin in circulation, that's going to be it. That doesn't happen until the year 2140. And so what's having is not the actual full Bitcoin supply on the market. Obviously, that's right. That is now freely floating out there. Uh, you can buy and sell that lifetime. Um, and, and there's plenty of BTC on exchange order books or held in wallets or transacted OTC. Nothing changes there. It's really just the new supply that comes from validating new blocks of Bitcoin, um, you know, every, every 10 minutes, basically. And so that reward, which used to be, you know, 6.25 BTC is now having to 3.125 Bitcoin. So when you think about that in like, you know, what does that mean on, on, on like a, from a price perspective of how that might impact the market, you can kind of say, okay. Well, if I know that there's now 3.125 less Bitcoin being mined per block, that's roughly 450 Bitcoin being mined less per day. Uh, and that can add up over time. So long term, you know, that's something like $12 billion at current prices of less new Bitcoin supply that's coming onto the market. But short term, 450 Bitcoin de you know, deficit per day is not really going to move the needle. Right, right. OK, well, let's go and look back at the past. You mentioned, you know, 2012, 2016, 2020. Uh, obviously, this year a little bit different with the ETFs, but talk to me a little bit about the typical effects on Bitcoin's price and maybe the market behavior in the months following the halving. 
Yeah, for sure. So I think, you know, short term, what, what typically tends to happen is everybody gets all excited about the having. Uh, a lot of that comes from just lack of understanding of what's, of what's really happening behind the scenes and the magnitude of what that means. And so people expect the price to move when the having happens. But like I said, right, short term, the only, the only, the only, you know, change here is that there's 450 Bitcoin that's less being probably mecha- like methodically sold by miners on a daily basis. Um, but that being said, right, miners are now making less revenue per day uh, because there's less Bitcoin to sell per day. And so they still have their, you know, cost of electricity. They still have people to pay. They still have their variable expenses. So how are they going like, to compensate, right, for the fact that they have less daily revenue? They might actually sell some of their working capital, right, or inventory that they've held since the last cycle on their balance sheet to actually offset some of that. So you might even see in the short term, prices go down. Uh, so I'd expect some choppiness in the short term. Now, long term, right, the 450 Bitcoin per day add up. That's 165,000 BTC per year of net less supply. Um, and so, you know, if you just look at Bitcoin's performance the month following the halving, right, it's kind of like a nothing burger. So if you look back to 2012, Bitcoin moved 9% to the upside the month after the halving. If you looked mm-hmm. at 2016, Bitcoin lost 10% of its value the month following the halving. If you looked at the last halving in 2020, Bitcoin gained 6% the month following the halving. So pretty muted, right? Swings up and drawdowns. Now, if you zoom out and you say, well, what's the, what's the longer term impact after those events? Well, if you look back to 2012, the year after, Bitcoin appreciates, appreciated over 8,000%. In 2016, Bitcoin appreciated over 285%. And in 2020, Bitcoin appreciated over 550% the following year. So that brings us to 2024. Short term, I think you can look at that data. You can also understand, right, kind of the, the muted effect this is going to have on the day to day. And it might be a sell the news event. Uh, but then long term, right, you have the combined new demand from the ETFs, which we could talk about, plus this net less supply over the course of the year. You're likely to see a pretty, a pretty big move higher over the course of the year. All right. So we talked a little bit about where we're at, you know, given the current economic climate, we got this interest rate, tobacco wins, the cuts going to happen. Uh, we have the Bitcoin ETFs. We had a huge maturity happen with the inflows. Is this one going to be different? What should investors be watching for specifically here? I mean, you said there's some choppy waters and we're seeing that now, but for the most part, the Bitcoin investors are pretty used to some volatility. Yeah, it's a great question. I think, look, Short term, um, you know, I, I think the Bitcoin's right has, has done has performed really well over the last few months. Um, obviously, since the the dawn of the nine new Bitcoin ETFs that um, you know started trading a few months ago, we've seen massive new demand from the institutional part of the market, uh, and so that's that's you know I think allowed for a pretty meaningful runoff in the price of BTC. It's not going to be crazy, right? If Bitcoin needs to cool off a little bit here, uh, the market might be a little overheated. You know, we're seeing some. Um, you know, p- p- just potential ambiguity on a macro level, right? With just when interest rate cuts might happen on one side, and then also the you know global conflict that's happening in the Middle East right now. So I think you kind of have the tale of two stories here, right? There's there's ambiguity in terms of the macro picture and how that's going to impact Bitcoin right now, but you still have this you know kind of surging in in you know longer term new net net new demand on the institutional side of the market through these nine new ETFs. Um, you know, it, it's been one of the most successful ETF launches of all time. We've seen $12.2 billion in aggregate net inflows. That's even accounting for the outflows from Grayscale's uh, GBTC. Um, and I really think we're just getting started here in terms of true institutional adoption and now access to Bitcoin on a global scale. So, you know, I think short term, yeah, there's some macro catalysts here that will likely kind of make this market a little choppy. Um, you know, there might, see, might be some near term volatility here. But long term, I do think it's going to be, you know, the, the little engine that could, I think it'll continue chugging along. And, and I think 2024 will end up being a pretty good year for, for BTC. Yeah, you mentioned it. I mean, we had incredible unprecedented inflows into the market. I mean, there's been recent reports indicating some significant outflows of ETFs, notable withdrawals from products like Grayscale and ARC21 shares. I'm curious, I mean, is this just profit taking at this point? Yeah, I mean, look, it's 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 tax season. It could be profit yeah. taking. I think there's a there's a there's a host of reasons, you know, why folks might want to take some gains off the table here. And you're seeing that right in the two ETFs that you mentioned, um, right? Grayscale and Arc. I think Grayscale particularly has seen you know a constant stream of net outflows just because of the fee structure of that ETF. 
uh, making it really not viable relative to the other nine. But if you look at the core ETFs, uh, like BlackRock's IBIT or Fidelity or even Bitwise, um, you know, you're starting, you're, you're, you're starting to see just inflows only. Uh, I, I don't think actually BlackRock's ETF ha has had a net outflow day since it, since it incepted. So the fact that even despite some of the macro uncertainty here uh, and some profit taking kind of that naturally happens at this time of year along with tax season, uh, the fact that there are still kind of this uh, accumulation really that's, that's kind of being highlighted across these ETFs is really um, telling. And, and I do think that that trend will continue. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of people watching this price uh, going to be an interesting time as the countdown's on. You know, having also reduces the rewards for miners in half. We talked about this. Uh, what impact do you see this having on the mining communities, especially for the smaller operations versus maybe the larger that have more capital? Yeah, it's a great question. So what typically happens in each of these miner cycles um, is, you know, obviously the, the revenue that miners can now generate by mining uh, goes down by half on all net new, right, blocks mined. And that being said, right, their costs still remain the same. So they're still paying for electricity. They still have payroll. Uh, they still have all of their kind of fixed contracts. And, you know, what this does is it puts, it puts strain and pressure on, you know, miners' operations. Um, mm -hmm. But it's also almost one of these kind of Darwinian effects where the strongest miners, those that have balance sheet, uh, those that have access to capital, those that have kind of prepared for this event and maybe have sold, you know, Bitcoin to kind of generate uh, enough dollars to kind of withstand, they tend to get stronger. Um, and that's because the smaller fish that really can't afford to stay in business at these levels if price doesn't move will ultimately unplug their machines and go offline. Um, right. there, you know, I think you're going to see a lot of consolidation in the miner space. So some of the larger miners will likely uh, acquire some of the smaller ones. Um, I think this is a great opportunity, right, for for markets for miners to kind of prepare uh, for the long term. Here, a lot of them have upgraded their fleets of uh, mining, you know, of miners to the newest equipment to be a lot more efficient to actually withstand this kind of event. And then ultimately, you know, I think once once this halving is in the rear view, price will continue to appreciate higher, and that's where these miners that have kind of fortified their balance sheets, acquired new companies, have economies of scale, have access to financing will come out on the other side. But I do think, you know, it's certainly going to take the lives of a few of the smaller, less efficient miners who will probably be out of the game, you know, over the course of this year. Yeah, and we've seen this in different industries as well, where it starts to kind of, you know, companies pivot and they start to go to the picks and shovels. And, and I've noticed with a lot of miners, a lot of these companies have been doing this. Maybe they're going to start selling their computing power or, you know, some of the things that they have on the network now. There's a way to kind of pivot here and still be uh, profitable. Yeah, that, that's right. I think that's 100 percent right. I think you know it really comes down to preparedness and efficiency and balance sheet. And right. you know the largest miners, whether it's Marathon or Riot or Hot Eight, you know a lot of these folks have have gone through this now three times. This is the fourth one. Uh, each one of those is a learning lesson, and there are ways to kind of stay nimble, stay profitable, generate enough cash to kind of with, withstand this kind of event, um, and then and then actually use it as a way to to be opportunistic uh, and and kind of get ahead for the next cycle. So I do think you're going to see that phenomenon play out, kind of similar to, to past cycles as well. Totally, yeah, it's so fascinating. Okay, let's look beyond the having event. Uh, let's talk about the whole landscape with crypto and Bitcoin uh, and how it's going to evolve over the next few years. I'm wondering, I mean, you're at the forefront of this matter. Are there any major trends or innovations that could really reshape the current market? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. I think, um, you know, from BitGo's perspective, right, we've yeah. been in the space for a long time. We've built, you know, one of the most well-known businesses as it pertains to regulated custody and safeguarding of assets. I think that theme, right, obviously in the wake of FTX and what happened uh, in the last bull market, right, kind of in 2021 and 2022, mm -hmm. people started to really value and think about, you know, where they keep their assets. Uh, but there becomes this question of, okay, how do I optimize for security of my assets, but also be able to tap into, you know, efficient liquidity in the marketplace? So Bitco is solving for that specific problem where we've created something called Go Network. Uh, the ability for folks to hold both crypto and fiat in custody at a qualified custodian. So any of the big asset managers, whether it's venture venture funds, large hedge funds that have to operate under SEC rules, need to keep assets at a qualified custodian. BitGo yeah. provides that service through our South Dakota trust entity. And then through Go Network, we actually have the ability to connect those assets 
to liquidity venues without those folks having to actually move those assets outside of cold storage and BitGo. So it's a really novel kind of market structure evolution that we've created to better service our clients, to you know, effectively mitigate their risk, but keep them connected to liquidity. Um, that, that theme around kind of separation of assets in custody and trading is going to continue to evolve, I think, in the space. Um, you know, there's other players that are kind of looking at similar kinds of structures, but we are really right at the forefront front of it. Um, you know, we're talking to some of the largest asset managers and allocators in the world about this service specifically. Um, there's a ton of interest out there, you know, just in terms of sheer participation in the market. Um, and we're having conversations now around, you know, prime financing, collateral management services, you know, uh, uh, regulated custody, tri-party management. So the real institutionalization of the market is starting to happen and we expect that trend to continue. So I do think, um, you know, the whole industry is leveling up in a sense and, and the, the maturation of the market is happening kind of right, right in front of our eyes. Yeah, I mean, you got guys like Larry Fink, you know, talking about this, uh, Abigail Johnson over BlackRock. Uh, how important has these ETFs been for the maturation of the market? I mean, you know, before you'd have to send money here, do this, do that. It seems like this is a huge game changer this year and going forward after the halving as well. Absolutely. Yeah. The, I mean, the, the fact that there are now nine new avenues for institutional investors to get exposure to Bitcoin in a way that they're comfortable with, that takes the burden of custody off of their plates, it cannot be understated. Um, and to your point, right, having some of these, um, you know, really new champions of Bitcoin, whether it be Larry Fink or Abigail Johnson, kind of serving as like the global mouthpiece for the value prop of what Bitcoin is in an institutional portfolio is unbelievable. Like if, if we were to rewind five years and you were to tell me that Larry Fink would be here on, you know, in, in front of the world kind of, um, you know, speaking praises of, of, of Bitcoin and, and how, you know, investors should think about crypto as, as, as a serious, you know, part of their, of their, of their allocated portfolios. I don't think I would have believed you. So it's, it's been amazing to see that evolution. Uh, it definitely can't be understated. I think there, that effect will, will slowly matriculate into the market. You're going to see pensions, endowments, sovereigns, you know, RIAs and others start to take that, you know, and really assess does Bitcoin make sense in my portfolio, in our mandate as an organization, and then getting their clients right to, to kind of accept the same belief and, and ultimately own a piece of crypto as part of their portfolio. So I think we're in the early innings of that, uh, of that process. And that is why, you know, I particularly am, am bullish on Bitcoin's right uh, run over the next year or two or even three. Yeah, you know, I won't before I let you go because we got to take off here. I'm curious because you brought up the I, uh, the RIAs. Uh, we've seen some of this older money come in. You know, the institutional interest is there. Uh, is this just the beginning? Yeah. So, so Bico, we're very bullish on the concept of of these investment advisors entering the market in in a large, meaningful way. Um, the RIA market is a $100 trillion market in terms of capital managed. So it is a huge, you know, uh, addressable market opportunity uh, for, for crypto at large. So, we, you know, we're gearing up for that. We actually recently acquired a company called Brassica that, um, you know, kind of really deals with the sub accounting and infrastructure to support that. And also a company called Hide Zero that actually has, um, you know, really built the bridge between the RIA world and, and capital allocators and crypto services. So, uh, Bitco, you know, I think we, it's certainly our thesis that, that, that trend will, uh, you know, will be going one way. Uh, we, we think a lot of capital from the RIA segment is going to come into the market and we're just trying to kind of gear up to capture as much of that flow as we can. Amen. Well, we'll be keeping an eye on having and what it looks like for everybody watching. Uh, Matt Balanchweg, head of Go Network and managing director at Bitco joining us today. Hey, Matt, thanks for coming on. And really explaining this to me today helped out. Thanks so much for having me on. Real, a real pleasure and uh, look forward to talking soon. Yeah, we'll have you on uh, eventually after we see this chart and what some of this volatility looks like. Appreciate your time. Thanks so much. I'm Jeremy Safford. Thank you again for tuning in and watching Kitco News. Don't forget to subscribe and to like our channel for all the latest. We'll see you next time.